Well, please open your Bible at Romans and chapter 12. This is the last week in our series, Growing in Love. We have set a priority to intentionally pursue individually and together, growing in love. We began by the, with the question, why should we grow in love? And we saw that we must grow in love because love is our distinct calling. Jesus said, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The natural response to growing anger and hostility in the world is going to be growing anger and hostility in churches. That's the natural response. But you see, Jesus calls us to something very, very different. This is our distinct calling, that we will be marked as those who belong to Jesus because we love by this, all people will know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. So we must grow in love because it is our distinct calling. And then we saw that we must grow in love because love is our greatest need. Without love, all of our gifts, all of our achievements, and all of our sacrifices would be of no value at all. And we saw that love is like a tree that's just bursting with good fruit. Grow in love and you will be more patient and more kind and you won't envy. You'll grow in emotional intelligence and wisdom and in discernment. And we saw that growing in love is of supreme value because love endures forever. When everything else passes away, faith, hope, and love will remain. So a desire has been stirred in our hearts. We want to grow in love. Love for God, love for family, love for God's people, love for neighbors and for friends and for colleagues, love even for enemies, those with whom we most deeply disagree. And then we ask the question, how? How can I grow in love? And we looked at the first answer to that question last week. You can grow in love because you are loved. And this is wonderful good news, that love is not something that we need to find in ourselves and sort of pull up from within. No, love, God is love. And love comes, John says, from God. And we love because he first loved us. God poured out his love for us in and through his son who he sent to be the propitiation for our sins. That's how God's love was poured out. And then we saw that God's love has been poured into our hearts by the presence of the Holy Spirit. When you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God himself comes to live in you. And we laughed at the incongruous thought of what it would be like if the Spirit of Mick Jagger lived in me. But think about how amazing this is. The Holy Spirit of God himself, the God who is love, lives in sinners like us. That is astonishing, marvelous, glorious. The presence of the Spirit of God who is love makes it possible for you to grow in love. It is as God's love flows into us that it then flows out from us. And if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ today, you really can grow in love because of the Spirit of God who lives, who dwells in you. So the first answer to the question, how can I grow in love, is you can grow in love because you are loved. And you are more deeply loved than you will ever be able to fathom we love because he first loved us. Now, today we're going to look at two further answers to the question, how can I grow in love? We're going to look at several different scriptures today, but we're going to begin 
in Romans in chapter 12. And this chapter, rather like 1 Corinthians 13 and 1 John and chapter 4 that we looked at last time, it is an exposition of love. Uh, love is the theme that runs all the way through. So, for example, in verses 3 to 8, uh, the apostle lays out how we serve with our gifts and how this is a wonderful expression of love. Then in verse 9, Paul says, let love be genuine. Verse 10, love one another with brotherly affection. Then he lays out what a life of love looks like. Verse 13, it involves contributing to the needs of the saints or practicing hospitality. Verse 14, blessing those who persecute you. Verse 15, weeping with those who weep, rejoicing with those who rejoice. Verse 16, living in harmony with one another. Or verse 20, feeding your enemy when he is hungry and giving him something to drink when he is thirsty. This is what a life of love looks like. But here's the question. Where does it begin? And so if you look at the very beginning of this chapter, verse 1, you have the answer. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And you see what he's telling us right from the beginning? Love that is the theme of this whole chapter involves sacrifice. If you want to grow in love, you have to lay down your life on the altar of God. That is what he's saying. Jesus said it this way, greater love has no one than this, than that someone lay down his life for his friends. Love always involves sacrifice. And a life of love is a life in which we learn to say no to ourselves so that we can bring help and blessing to others. Now, this, of course, is what our Lord Jesus Christ so wonderfully did. By far the easiest and by far the most comfortable choice for the Lord Jesus Christ would have been to remain in heaven and to enjoy the love he had always enjoyed there with the Father. But if he had done that, we would have lived and died without hope. We would have been utterly lost forever and forever. And so Jesus did not grasp onto what was easiest and most comfortable for him. He took the form of a servant, the Bible tells us. He was made in the likeness of men. He left heaven. He came to earth. He loved us. And he gave himself for us. Jesus said no to his own comfort in order to bring blessing and life to us. Love involved a cross for the Lord Jesus Christ, and love will involve a cross for us too. You remember that Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, if you're going to be my disciple, he said, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Love always involves sacrifice. It always involves saying no to self in order to bring help and blessing to others. And, you know, this can happen in the simplest of ways, in the most ordinary things of life. Love chooses to get up and help rather than simply to sit on the couch. Love gives more weight to the needs and even the feelings of other people than it gives to our own. Love is always putting itself in another person's shoes and asking the question, how can I bring help and blessing to him or to her? Now, when the Apostle Paul describes a life of love in Romans and chapter 12, this is where he begins. 
I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Now, you read a verse like that, and of course, you say, we all say, how am I to do that? And I want you to notice that the key word in this verse is the word, therefore. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Clearly, the therefore refers back to something that was said before in the earlier chapters of Romans. We are to present ourselves as living sacrifices in the light of something. There's something then in the earlier chapters of Romans that when fully grasped and fully embraced makes it possible for you to give yourself for the blessing of others, to present yourself as a living sacrifice to God. Now, what is it? What is it that makes this possible? Well, there is, of course, a sense in which what Paul is referring to here is everything that is in Romans chapter 1 through 11. But there is one truth in these chapters that is repeatedly presented in the New Testament as the key to growing in love. And that is that in Christ, you have already died and risen. This is stated most clearly in Romans chapter 6 and verses 3 and 4. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Now, very simply, when you became a Christian, you came to be in Christ. And because you are in Christ, what was true of Jesus is also true of you. Jesus died, and Jesus rose again. And when you're in Christ, the same is true of you as well. The person that you were before, the person living for himself or herself, died. And you have been raised to a whole new life. That's what Paul is referring to here, that you might walk in newness of life. And of course, all of this is beautifully expressed in baptism. Going down into the water is a sign that the person you were has died. And coming up out of the water is a sign that you are now walking in newness of life. In Christ, you have already died and risen. Now, that's the principle. And what I want us to see today is how it works out in practice. First, you can grow in love because having died, you are no longer a slave to yourself. Now, what a wonderful truth this is. Because in Christ you have died already, you are no longer a slave to yourself, and that is why and how you can love. You see this very clearly in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 14 and 15. Notice how Paul speaks about love here. For the love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died, and he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Now, what a marvelous statement this is. The love of Christ controls us. Who would not want to be able to say that? 
the love of Christ controls me. What would that mean? Well, it would mean that the love of Christ restrains me from speaking a harsh or a hurtful word. It would mean that the love of Christ moves me to care and to bless and to support others. A love controlled by, a life controlled by the love of Christ would be energized, moved, directed, active. Love would reach into and touch the lives of other people in as much as we are controlled by the love of Christ. Now, how does this come about? That's Paul's purpose in these verses. How is it that a person comes to be controlled by the love of Christ? Well, notice what he says. The love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all and therefore all have died. You see, he's picking up the same wonderful truth that we just saw in Romans in chapter 6, that if you are in Christ, you have already died. And what is the effect of the person you were already having died? Well, he says this, that having died, they might no longer live for themselves. No longer live for themselves. No longer. So you see, living for yourself is actually the default life. That's just how we all start out. That's what we are by nature. The Bible says this quite clearly in Philippians in chapter 2 and verse 21. All seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Everyone seeks their own interest. And unless something changes, we all default to living for ourselves. Now, living for yourself might sound attractive, but actually, if you think about it, nothing could ever be more miserable. Think about this, to live for yourself. If you live for yourself, you're the one that's doing the living and you're the one that's being lived for. So, if you live for yourself, you are actually both the boss and the servant. You're kind of both sides of the ledger, so to speak. The demands that you set are the demands that you must meet. And so you're always in conflict with yourself. If you live for yourself, you're going to find yourself constantly in this very strange position of beating up on yourself. You're going to look at your life and, and, and self the boss is going to say, well, you should have accomplished more. And then, and then self the servant gets beat up on because of underperforming. And that goes on until at some point you say, well, this is, I'm not happy. I, 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 this isn't working. I, I need to lighten up on myself. And that thought will occur to you. I'm being too hard on myself. I need to give myself a break. And so now you lighten up on yourself, except you've still got a problem because self the servant gets let off the hook and now self the master doesn't get what he or she wants. Living for yourself is an absolute nightmare. When you lay it out as the master, you end up crushing yourself as the servant. And when you lighten up on yourself as the servant, you end up being shortchanged as self the master. You can never, never win. Now what Paul is saying in this marvelous verse is that when you come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are actually delivered from the miserable existence of living for yourself. You're now a new creation in Christ. You've been set free from this misery. You've been brought into a new liberty of living for Christ who loved you and gave himself for you. And the good news 
is that a life of saying no to self in order to bring blessing to others goes with the grain of the new creation that you are in Jesus Christ. Some of you will know the name of Eric Little. Uh, his story is told in the movie Chariots of Fire. Little was an Olympic athlete. And he said on one occasion, God made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. See, running was going with the grain for Eric Little. He was made for it. No doubt training was hard work for him as it would be for anyone else, but God made him fast. God made him to run. Now, when you are in Christ, you can say, God made me to love. And when you love, you will feel his pleasure. The last thing you want to do as a Christian believer is to live for yourself. You died to that. When you came to be in Christ, you've risen to a whole new life in the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And when you love, uh, love you are going with the grain of the new life that you now enjoy in Jesus Christ. When you say no to self in order to bring blessing to others, you are being who you are. And that is why you will experience peace and joy when you pursue a life of love. So how can we grow in love? You can grow in love because having died, you are no longer a slave to yourself. And then the second thing I want us to see today is this, and it's very wonderful, that you can grow in love because having risen, you enjoy an endless life. Now, it's the Apostle John who records the scene at the Last Supper the night when Jesus was betrayed, when Jesus beautifully washed the feet of his disciples. It was a stunning expression of humble, serving love. How did Jesus do this? Especially on the night that he knew he would be betrayed, the night that was ahead of all that he suffered, especially because his disciples, when they should have known better, were getting into a foolish argument about who was the greatest. And what the Lord Jesus Christ does is not thinking of himself. He gives himself to this marvelous expression of humble serving love towards his own disciples. How did he do it? Well, John tells us John in chapter 13 and verse 3, he says, Jesus, knowing that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from the supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Now you see what John's saying? Jesus knew what lay ahead of him. He knew that he was going back to God. He knew that the endless joy of life in the presence of the Father was what was in store for him. And knowing this, he was free to serve. Put yourself for a moment with me in the shoes of someone who does not have eternal life. I want you to think about this. Your life in this world is the best you will ever know. And your life in this world is short. And so you are always worried about it slipping away. 
If the only good you're ever going to enjoy is what you get here and now, you will live in the constant fear of missing out. And with so little life, if something should happen in your experience that harms or shortens this little life that you have, you will feel a sense of ultimate loss. All I have is this little stretch of life. And now it's all been spoiled. Without eternal life, you're going to be drawn to one of two alternatives. Either you're going to throw yourself recklessly into a life of indulgence, try everything, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die, just live it up. Or you're going to live with a sense of constant fear, grasping on to what you have, trying desperately not to let it slip through your fingers. But brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have life everlasting. Everlasting. Life inexhaustible. Never ending. Pleasures greater by far than anything that we can know in this life and in this world at its very best. They are stored up forever and forever for you in the presence of the Father. And knowing this puts you in an entirely different position throughout the days and months and years of your life in this world. When you know you have eternal life, you can offer yourself as a living sacrifice You can give yourself to the service of others. You can offer yourself into the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. And knowing his love for you, that is precisely what you will want to do. When you know that having risen, you enjoy an endless life, you will be delivered from the haunting fear of missing out. And if the life that you had hoped to enjoy is in some way harmed or spoiled or unexpectedly shortened, you will grieve. But you will do this knowing that you have an endless life of unclouded joy that stretches eternally in front of you. And that makes all the difference in the world. How can I grow in love? Well, as we saw last week, we can grow in love because we are loved. And today we're adding these two further marvelous answers to this question. You can grow in love because having died, you are no longer a slave to yourself. And you can grow in love because having risen, you enjoy an endless life. Some of you will know the name of Amy Carmichael, a marvelous lady who served the Lord Jesus Christ as a missionary in India for 55 years, an extraordinary life of love. Amy Carmichael wrote an extended meditation on what she called Calvary love. That is, love that sacrifices. That's what Jesus did when he laid down his life at Calvary. Let me read just seven sentences from what Amy Carmichael wrote. If I have not compassion on my fellow servant, even as my Lord had pity on me, then I know nothing of Calvary love. If I can easily discuss the shortcomings and the sins of others, then I know nothing of Calvary love. If I can write an unkind letter 
Speak an unkind word, think an unkind thought without grief and shame, then I know nothing of Calvary love. If my thoughts revolve around myself, if I am so occupied with myself that I rarely have a heart at leisure from itself, then I know nothing of Calvary love. If I do not give a friend the benefit of the doubt, but put the worst construction instead of the best on what is said or done, then I know nothing of Calvary love. If I take offense easily, if I'm content to continue in a cool unfriendliness, though friendship be possible, then I know nothing of Calvary love. If I say, yes, I forgive, but I cannot forget, as though the God who twice a day washes all the sands on all the shores of all the world could not wash such memories from my mind, then I know nothing of Calvary love. Our series has been entitled, Growing in Love. So I want to close it by saying it this way. Grow in love and you will be patient. Grow in love and you will be kind. Grow in love and you will always have hope. Grow in love and you will be freed from resentment. Grow in love and you will be able to forgive. Grow in love and you will deny yourself. Grow in love, and you will take up your cross. Grow in love, and you will be a disciple of Jesus. Grow in love, and you will shine like a light in this world. Let's pray together, shall we? Our Father, we thank you for the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, who loving us gave himself for us. Grow within us by the power of your Spirit a true reflection of his great love for us that we too might grow in the life of love to which you have called us. And may it be for your praise, your glory, and your honor for these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.